There is not one cardiac action potential, but several action potentials with characteristics that differ depending on where in the heart they are recorded from. The action potentials initiated at the sinoatrial node are specialised for pacemaking. The membrane potential changes continuously, not just during the action potential, but also between action potentials. Conducting pathways spread the action potential to the atrial muscle cells, where more distinct phases are apparent. The upstroke is much faster and the membrane potential is silent between events. The action potential reaching the atrial ventricular node has a similar shape to those recorded from the sinoatrial node. That is because the atrial ventricular node can also act as a pacemaker to keep the ventricles beating if the sinoatrial node fails, and its action potential enables it to act as a filter to limit the number of impulses that reach the ventricles if they arrive too frequently. As the action potential is conducted down the Purkinje fibres of the conducting system, it changes again. It activates rapidly and has a long plateau phase, which prevents premature contraction of the ventricles. The action potential reaching ventricular muscle has a pronounced and prolonged plateau, which is important for calcium influx and the control of contraction. It also prevents premature re-excitation of the muscle. The ventricular action potential is longer than the signal in atrial muscle, which must finish contracting and ejecting blood into the ventricles before the more powerful ventricles contract. The action potentials are all drawn on the same voltage and time scale here to clarify the comparison. The differences among the action potentials are due to differential expression of different ion channels. In this presentation, I will explain the most extreme differences between the sinoatrial node and ventricular muscle cells. This action potential is typical of cardiac muscle cells. Starting at the resting membrane potential, between action potentials, the membrane is highly permeable to potassium ions, which continually leak from the cell through potassium channels. The membrane is highly impermeant to other ions because the other ion channels present are closed. So, essentially, the only ion flowing is potassium. Consequently, the resting potential is close to the equilibrium potential for potassium ions at around minus 90 millivolts. The arrival of an action potential from the conducting Purkinje fibres causes depolarization, which raises the membrane potential to the threshold for activating sodium channels, therefore increasing sodium permeability. These are fast activating channels so there is a rapid influx of sodium ions, causing a rapid and large depolarization to form the upstroke of the action potential. The action potential reaches a peak when the membrane potential approaches the equilibrium potential for sodium ions and the sodium channels become inactivated, reducing sodium flux. Depolarization also activates L-type calcium channels, which open more slowly and increase calcium permeability. So, after the peak of the action potential, calcium influx keeps the cell depolarized for a while, forming a plateau phase. There are quite complex changes in potassium channel activity during the early part of the action potential, but Essentially, depolarization initially causes an overall drop in potassium permeability and efflux so that calcium ions can maintain depolarization. But as the action potential proceeds, the potassium permeability increases again while the calcium permeability gradually falls. Eventually, potassium efflux dominates and repolarizes the membrane potential to the resting level. 
calcium influx during the plateau phase triggers muscle contraction and it refills the intracellular calcium stores used for contraction. Now let's look at the permeability changes directly by superimposing them on the action potential. The y-axis scale is the membrane permeability of an ion measured relative to the potassium permeability at the resting membrane potential. Starting with sodium, its permeability is very low at the resting potential, but a small depolarization to threshold causes a large rapid increase in sodium ion permeability, which quickly reaches a peak due to channel inactivation and the membrane potential approaching the sodium reversal potential. The calcium ion permeability changes much more slowly because calcium channels open more slowly than sodium channels. Calcium permeability is very low at the resting potential, but it slowly increases after sodium influx has depolarized the membrane, and it remains fairly steady for over 100 milliseconds before declining quite rapidly as the membrane repolarizes and the channels close. A key factor driving the shape of the action potential is the behaviour of potassium channels, which, as I previously said, is complex. At the resting potential, the membrane is much more permeable to potassium than any other ion, and depolarization caused by sodium influx initially causes it to fall. It remains at a low level for some time before increasing fairly quickly to drive cell repolarization. There are three points to take away from this diagram. Firstly, the action potential plateau occurs when the calcium and potassium ion permeabilities are both fairly constant. Secondly, the calcium permeability drops quickly once the potassium permeability starts to rise and cause repolarization. Finally, you should be asking, why does the potassium permeability fall during the action potential, then increase? It's probably not what you were expecting. The answer is that multiple potassium channels with different properties, including voltage sensitivity, are involved. I will explain their properties and interactions in a separate video. Now we will consider the ion permeability changes during an action potential in the sinoatrial node. This is the action potential of a pacemaker cell. Similar waveforms are recorded in sinoatrial and atrioventricular node cells. There is no resting potential, so we will start at the lowest point of the action potential. As in muscle cells, the membrane is permeable to potassium and the basal flux of potassium generates a negative membrane potential. The membrane potential never becomes as negative as in muscle cells though because the potassium flux is opposed by sodium flux through a non-selective cation channel known as the HCN or funny channel. It has unique properties that specialise it for pacemaking. It is activated by membrane hyperpolarization, and it depolarizes the membrane. The depolarization in turn activates T-type calcium channels, which continue to depolarize the membrane while also closing the funny channels. The funny channels and T-type channels therefore work together to generate a pacemaker potential. The depolarization eventually reaches a threshold for opening L-type calcium channels, which mediate the upstroke of the action potential. Depolarization also activates potassium channels, which oppose depolarization and eventually overcome the effect of calcium current to repolarize the membrane back to the level that activates HCN channels. And the cycle begins again. A key point to note 
is that because calcium channels mediate the upstroke, it is much slower than the upstroke of muscle cells. This is particularly important at the atrioventricular node because it slows conduction, allowing separation of the atrial and ventricular beats. We will now look at the permeability changes in more detail. As before, the permeability of each ion is plotted relative to potassium at the lowest membrane potential. Looking first at potassium ions, you can see that, as in muscle cells, the potassium permeability is highest at the most negative potentials, drops during the upstroke and peak of the action potential, then increases rapidly to repolarize the membrane. Next, the permeability changes due to funny channels. The channels are permeable to both potassium and sodium, so the overall permeability change reflects a mix of the two ions. You can see that the permeability starts to increase during the repolarization phase of the action potential because the channels are opened by membrane hyperpolarization. Sodium influx through the channels brings the repolarization phase to an end and drives membrane depolarization. But the depolarization starts to close the funny channels and permeability falls again before the cell has reached the action potential threshold. So, something else is needed to continue the depolarization, and that something is the T-type calcium channel. It is closed and contributes little to membrane permeability throughout much of the action potential, but it opens briefly during the depolarization caused by funny channels and takes the membrane to threshold. In pacemaker cells, the action potential threshold is determined not by sodium channels, but by L-type calcium channels, which give rise to an increase in calcium permeability that lasts until the repolarization phase of the action potential. So, the funny channels and T-type calcium channels work together to form the pacemaker potential that drives the membrane to threshold and opens L-type calcium channels. This mechanism relies on the activation of funny channels by hyperpolarization and the T-type calcium channels having a low voltage threshold for activation by depolarization. There are three main molecular targets of the sympathetic neurotransmitter noradrenaline. They are the L-type calcium channel, the HCN channel, and phospholamban, which regulates circa and calcium uptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of the effects of sympathetic nerve stimulation on the heart are mediated by beta-1 adrenergic receptors. The receptor activates the GS protein, causing the alpha and beta-gamma subunits to dissociate. The alpha subunit activates the enzyme adenylcyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which has two effects. It phosphorylates the alpha subunit of the L-type calcium channel, making it more likely to open when the cell is depolarized. As a consequence, a greater proportion of channels open during the action potential, which increases calcium influx while prolonging the action potential. As a result, filling of the store with calcium is increased, providing a larger store of calcium to activate contraction when it's released. Protein kinase A also phosphorylates phospholamban, relieving its inhibition of circa and stimulating calcium accumulation by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This enables muscle to relax quicker and there is more calcium available for release and to activate contraction. Not all of cyclic AMP's actions require protein kinase. It has a direct effect on the HCN channel. In fact, the HCN channel is unusual, not just because it is activated by hyperpolarization, but 
because it is also gated by cyclic nucleotides. In the absence of cyclic nucleotides, a region in the C-terminal end that contains a cyclic nucleotide binding domain holds the channel in a closed state. The binding of two molecules of cyclic AMP to the binding domain causes a conformational change. This increases the sensitivity of the channel to voltage. So, as the pacemaker action potential repolarizes, there is enhanced opening of funny channels, which increases the slope of the pacemaker potential and increases the rate of contraction. You should now have a good grasp of cardiac ion channels, how they shape cardiac action potentials in different cells, and how they are regulated by sympathetic innervation. I hope you found the video as helpful and informative as I intended. Thank you for watching.